We ended up hanging out with Dave and Kelly for a while yesterday evening, and then we made our way over to Indiana. This is my first time ever in Indiana, so I'm pretty excited. We're in a little town called Long Beach now. We stayed not too far away from there, though, at a Pilot Flying J last night. It was Antine's first time ever at a truck stop. What did you think of it? It's a little louder than some of the other areas that we've stayed, res residential neighborhoods and stuff, Yeah, but it was fine. We didn't really have any issues. I've never really had an issue at them before. You tend to blend right in. There's usually a couple other campers and RVs, so it worked out well. Today is mostly going to be a driving day for us. We're going to be making our way up the coast to Lake Michigan, into Michigan, and try to find a free campsite up in that area later on this evening. But that's not going to be until the next video. This video, we just kind of wanted to come down and check out the lake. We hadn't really seen it yet really up close and personal. We were able to like step in it and like walk around and stuff, and it's actually really nice. But this video is going to be mostly a Q&A. Works the same way as always. Post your questions below and then I'll answer them as part of the Q&A section of next Tuesday's vlog. First one comes from NFL61. They say, what area of Boston are you from? My wife's family is from Lowell. Uh, right on, you also said that you went to junior high and high school in Casper, Wyoming. Yeah, it seemed like a pretty cool town. Regarding where I'm from in Boston, I grew up in the South Coast, uh, Massachusetts area, so about an hour or so just south of Boston. Jay wanders out. When you pull in and want to take a nap, do you climb over the center car? or do you open up the back door and get in that way so basically whenever I'm trying to come back here whether it's to set up for bed at night or if it's to just come back here and take a nap or hang out and sit here and do this video or whatever it may be I'm always climbing through the center console the element has suicide doors so it's actually impossible to open up this rear door here without opening up the front door so that would make it really difficult and I've made it so that I can set up the bed in here even while I'm still in here so I never have to like get out to set up the bed or anything like that I can do it all contained within the element element so I, I always do that I always climb for the center console David Moore I uh, love the channel Nate uh, thank you when it's time to turn in for the night do you make efforts to not to seem like you're not getting into the back of the element to sleep do you cross into the back between the front seats so I, I just entered that part I never go out and try to re-enter through the rear doors but yeah I mean in terms of coming back here to set up I try to be as quiet as I can especially if I'm stealth camping obviously if I'm out boondocking in the middle of nowhere like it's not a problem I don't have to, I don't even put up the front curtains usually when I do that but when I pull over to stealth camp I mean I put those curtains up right away and I try to be move as minimally as I can so that you know not to attract attention because you can see if I'm in here moving just even a little bit from the outside you can tell that there's someone in there so I try to be as as uh, quiet as I can and try not to move much at all. BA Woodward what is the etiquette for free camping sites how much space do you need to give other campers and do you ever arrive after dark uh, th those are some really good questions in terms of etiquette I don't know if there's like some code of ethics or something like that I've never like read anything or anything like that I'm sure there is somewhere but for how I approach that situation, I do try to give a solid amount of space to other campers, other folks in the area. Now, obviously, if it's like a super densely populated campground, this has only happened to me maybe once or twice, where I've been driving around looking for a spot and notice that there are tons of people in pretty much all the available spots. But if there's like an empty firing and no one's parked near it, then sure, I mean, I'll pull up to it. But as a general rule of thumb, I do try to give a solid amount of space to anybody that's around me. But more often than not, it, it I'm going to these campsites and there's there's no one there. There's like maybe one guy parked over in the distance or something like that. It's been pretty rare for me to pull up to one of these free campsites and have a bunch of people parked at them. And then in terms of arriving after dark, that's something that I do try to avoid. I have come up to some of these maybe like right around dusk time or so where there's a little bit of light left so that you can still kind of see what's going on and get an idea of where everybody is and if you're in an okay spot and if you're on a level ground and things like that. You want to be able to see your surroundings at least in an immediate distance so you know that you're not parked on top of someone else's site or you're parked on you know someone else's land or something like that accidentally. You got to be careful about some of those things. So I do try to 
I do try to arrive before it gets too dark, but I have, you know, got there around dusk or so after the sun's already set and it's worked out okay. Just, you want to be able to have enough light or even maybe just a really powerful flashlight so that you can see and make sure that your part's in an okay location. So I've gotten a lot of questions in response to the establishing South Dakota residency video that I that I did a couple of days ago. A lot of folks asking for more details about the process and a few like little random questions and stuff. And a lot of them have been repeats. So I'm just gonna go through the list of questions that a lot of people have asked here in regards to that. South Dakota questions here, let's see. Is your South Dakota license real ID compliant? And in other words, can you use it as an ID at an airport? So I didn't really know too much actually about the whole real ID compliance thing. I think I had heard of it and then kind of just forgot about it when I did this whole process because I do have a pass passport anyways, which is perfectly fine to use at an airport, and that's generally what I use anyways to fly, but I guess if you didn't have a passport, this is an important thing that you want to take note of. I did look on the Homeland Security website. I guess after the Patriot Act, they established this whole Real ID compliance thing, which has become stricter and stricter over the years, and certain states don't meet that requirement still. I think that most of them have gotten to the point that with certain exceptions, they all can meet that level, but it's either like a green, you're good, or it's a yellow, like you might be good, you might not be good. If you go on this Homeland Security website though, you can type in any state for real ID compliance and it'll show you which ones are compliant and which ones are in that yellow where they're almost compliant but not quite there. South Dakota was in the green though. And, and the thing is with this, I think that if they accepted a PO box, which I don't think that they do, then that would be a problem. So if it said, you know, my name and then PO box, whatever, Madison, South Dakota, then that would be a problem. But if it has a private mail, box it's an entirely different thing that is a physical address it is listed as 123 main street number 123 madison south dakota so on and so forth and, and that makes it so that it basically looks like a real address and takes the form of a real address and it works if it was p.o box it wouldn't work but if it's pmb it's okay or even if there isn't a pmb and it's just number 123 then that's even better and i think that that's maybe part of the difference I'm not super educated on it. I don't know every little detail about the Patriot Act and what Homeland Security is doing exactly, but from basically from what I saw on their website, the South Dakota license is real ID compliant. Another one that came up was how often do you need to renew the license? The South Dakota license will need to be renewed every five years. So I think I'll have to go there every five years. I know that some places you're able to renew remotely once every so many years or something like that, but I think that it's looking like more than likely I'll need to go back to South Dakota five years in five years and get it taken care of. And then another one, did you need a birth certificate for the driver's license? You need either a birth certificate or a passport. If you have a United States passport with a social security card, that's fine as well. But if you don't have a passport, then yes, to answer your question, you do need a birth certificate to get this taken care of. And the last one here relating to the whole South Dakota residency thing is what if I have a full-time job in another state? How does that affect my income tax? So regarding the income tax there, I, I think that having another job in another state is, for me at least, when I've, whenever I've done that before, I've just filed taxes in both the states. So at the end of the year, I just file a state return with both states. And I, I mean, last year I filed quite a few. I worked in I worked in North Dakota, I worked in Minnesota, obviously, for the sugar beet harvest in that area. I was kind of going over the border and working in Minnesota, but the express employment was in North Dakota. And then I had, you know, I obviously had California for the surf school thing, and then I obviously had, you know, Louisiana as well, and Massachusetts and Rhode Island as well, actually, because I was working for a company in Rhode Island for the one month before I left and hit the road. So I, I filed quite a few tax returns, and that's basically what I did and most of them I ended up getting any taxes that were withheld back because except for the state that I was a resident of because that's the state that you pay taxes to so I figured that it would work the same way a lot of folks do that where even if they're not not just regular folks people who are not living in vans or RVs or traveling full-time they work from you know along state borders a lot of people live right on the border from one state to another and they have to commute there and they have to you know they work there and they but they're residents of the other state and they have to pay taxes the other state at the end of the year and they get their taxes back usually from the state that they're working in because the state that they're a resident of is the state they need to pay taxes to. But I'm pretty sure that's how it would work with this as well. At least I think that's how it works. And then they also asked about how this would affect health care and how that all works. And that really depends on what your situation is. If you're in a certain area and you're planning to be in that area for an extended period of time, then it's okay to go with an HMO on an, on the ACA and all you need is just an address I think to do that when I when I first got on the ACA I just put in an address my address in Louisiana and they didn't ask for anything else and I just put that address in and, and it worked out I was able to get a plan and I had health care in Louisiana for the whole year for the most part even while I was traveling I still had it in Louisiana and just used it obviously with an HMO though that can be a problem because 
they only it's only really accepted in Louisiana. So if something happened where I needed to go back for like recurring treatment or something along those lines, I would have to go back to Louisiana to get health care. So that's part of the reason why I moved away from it. Also because my premium rates went up astronomically this past year, and I think they're only going to continue to rise based on what, what I'm seeing here. But either way, I, I ended up switching to an alternative to the ACA, a health cost-sharing ministry. I'm going to make a video going into detail about that more in the future because every time I bring it up, it seems that a lot of people are asking and they want to know more about it. I did talk a little bit about it in my budgeting video, my cost of van life video. I'll put a link at the end of this one here so you guys can check it out if you're curious. I did go into a little bit of detail but I want to talk more about that whole thing in the future. But yeah, in terms of healthcare, how it all affects it, I think that that really depends on your individual situation. And the biggest thing is just to do your research, try to figure out what plan works best for you, and then go from there. <music>